Good afternoon. I am Kelly Navies and I coordinate the Oral History Initiative here at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Welcome to Telling Tales of the Diaspora. This Community Day event was developed as part of the Making African America Symposium. I am honored to present this discussion with Jessica B. Harris about her fascinating collection of vintage postcards from the African diaspora. Jessica B. Harris holds a PhD from NYU, is Professor Emerita at Queens College and lectures internationally. The author of the memoir, My Soul Looks Back, as well as 12 cookbooks, her articles have appeared in Vogue, Food and Wine, Essence, and The New Yorker, among other publications. She's made numerous television and radio appearances and has been profiled in The New York Times. Considered one of the preeminent scholars of the food of the African diaspora, Harris has been inducted into the James Beard Cookbook Hall of Fame, received an honorary doctorate from Johnson and Wells University, and recently helped the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture conceptualize its cafeteria. The Heritage Radio Network sums her up saying, Dr. Jessica B. Harris damn near knows it all when it comes to African and Caribbean cuisine and culinary history. She's a living legend. Without further ado, I present Dr. Jessica B. Harris. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> She's like, ah, who is that masked man? I really want <laughs> to be, you know. Wow. This is you, and how are you doing? I am doing okay. I had a birthday on Thursday, so I'm getting older, but hopefully getting better like stinky cheese. I understand that. Happy birthday to you, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. Jessica, I am so intrigued by your vintage postcard collection. Tell me, how does the foremost expert on African-American foodways become a deltiologist or someone who collects postcards? A deltiologist? I didn't even know the word when I started collecting. Uh, it's, I'm going to try to be brief about it, but it's, it's a long sort of story and it's very circuitous. Um, at some point I was getting images for a book that I was writing in 1995, Lord, that's a while ago, that actually it was 1995 is right. Um, and I had to find images and I found that I was paying for them and it was, you know, mounting up and costing money I didn't have. And then I discovered that if one owned the image, and there's an awful lot of complicated legal stuff I don't need to get into, but that one had the ability to use the image. So it was like, oh, it's an excuse for doing more shopping. So I started looking for postcards and the postcards just became great fun. And, and um, I found them in all sorts of strange places ranging from antique shops in Barbados to the flea market in Paris. Well, let's get into this um, exciting collection of yours. You have traveled throughout the world, Europe and Africa and the Americas to collect these cars. This first card, carrying water, reminds me of when I see this card, I think of the Ailey dancers dancing to wade in the water in Revelations. Tell me about this card and why you well, drew this, to, what, you drew, what drew you to this particular card. Well, at some point, I, I just like the composition of the card. The composition of the card was extraordinary. The fact that there are all of these women and it actually, the uh, caption says, uh, so they're working, they're carrying water, not necessarily for their own use, but for somebody else's use, probably. And it was in Dahomey, which is today's Benin, Benin. Um, and so the composition with all of these ladies with these beautiful, I'm not even sure if they're gourds or earthenware pots on their heads. And uh, one of the things that I'm always fascinated by is the attitude of people in the card. And so looking at these cards and looking at this, these women, I think about them, but I also think about water. And you know, we're living in a world where water security is an issue. We're living in a world where water safety is an issue. So this card reminds me of all of those things. Mm. Let's move on to the second card, the Griot card. No, we're in hulling rice. Hulling rice. Ah, hulling rice. This particular card, 
I loved because of this particular composition, the sym symmetry of the image drew me. And I was also thinking Madagascar in the, in the popular imagination, Madagascar seems mysterious and sometimes exotic. We don't see much about Madagascar. Exactly. Well, one of the things that's interesting is we know or we're increasingly learning about the whole connection of rice and Africa, the continent, and South Carolina and rice, the good. And the, um, the connection between the, what the French would call riziculture, the culture of growing rice, the methodology, the agricultural methodology of growing rice, that was brought in the brains and the hands of the enslaved people that came from what was called the Grain Coast, which it goes from sort of lower Senegal all the way over through Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia. And that area was noted for people who not only knew rice, but grew rice. Africa has its own indigenous rice, Oritsa glabirima, as opposed to the Oritsa sativa that we are familiar with. And those people were much prized and many were enslaved and taken to South Carolina. Those people are at the origins of some of the Gullah Geechee peoples. And so that rice growing knowledge is one thing but what we found is that the seed that was probably used in South Carolina may have come from Madagascar. Mm. So that we've got a kind of double thing going here. We've got the rice that was so important in South Carolina, but we also have the place that it may very well have come from. And what they're showing is almost two steps. They are um, husking the rice and then the woman with that round basket kneeling is sort of winnowing the rice. And that round basket, a form of that has also moved to South Carolina where they're called fanner baskets because they would fan the rice. I'm kind of making strange flapping motions with my hands because you take that basket, you toss the rice up in the air, it separates the rice from the chaff and that's how you you know, sort of process the rice, one of the ways that you process the rice. And <laughs> as is often the case, I'm gonna say something sort of non-PC now, the man is watching the women work. So <laughs> we've got the man in the doorway watching the two women process the rice. But it, it's, it's a card that's sort of loaded with imagery on so many levels telling many stories. I have to stop myself from asking you more questions because we have to move on. We have so many cards. Uh, this next one is the Griot. And this card was mailed in 1984, I understand. Not 1904, 1904. 1904. 'm <laughs> come forward come forward come forward oh come forward come come forward come forward come forward oh come forward come I want to tell you something time to hear a tale will you won't you come forward come forward come forward oh come forward come Keeper of the past, seer of the future. That's who I am. Who are you? <laughs> Sun kissed and strong, more civilized than civilized. Are you? Aren't you? Take the people away, call them a slave, ah, ah, but not a slave. Flesh and blood, human. Spirits rise, break the chains, ah, ah. 
No other lands you go. This you must know. Your ancestors are with you. Do you know? Don't you? Come forward, come forward, come forward. Oh, come forward, come. Come forward, come forward, come forward. Oh, come forward, come. What a moving interpretation of the griot card. Of course, my work as an oral historian owes much to the tradition of the griot. Um, Dr. Harris, is this how you would have imagined this particular card coming to life? I don't really know. I think I think it's extraordinary. I, I just love seeing them come to life. It's, it's just sort of, whoa, how wonderful. And that's courtesy of a friend of mine who is also a playwright that we'll hear from a little later, Gabrielle. Fulton Ponder, Ponder Fulton, um, and um, we'll see. Um, we'll see how that process took place. But I think the thing is that this is such an early card. It's 1904. It's stamped. It's mailed, and the whole idea of of the griot, of the 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 history maker, but also the history bearer, the storyteller, the person for whom all of this comes together and in whom all of this comes together. I think the thing was just so extraordinary for me to find not only a card of a griot, but such an early card of a griot. And, um, and then in the sort of working with Gabrielle, it was wonderful because we, um, we saw the Cora and the chora music was actually done by a friend of mine in Senegal who is a master chora player and who is also a monk. So mm. thanks go to Frère Maxime de la Providence in uh, Dakar, Senegal, because it's his chora music that we're hearing in all of this. So it was just such an extraordinary coming together of things to begin to use the cards in another way to really tell our history through the cards. And so with those cards and with the griot sort of stepping out, we'll hopefully come forward. Yes, um, I'm excited to hear from Gabrielle at the end of this program to see the ancient art of storytelling brought into the modern era of storytelling. It was, that was really fascinating. Um, now we're going to see a card, the, the Moorish Cafe, Blacks in a Moorish Cafe. And we have, two cards featuring the same group of handsome men um, with only one slight difference. Uh, tell me, what are your thoughts about this card and, and, and collecting both of these cards? Well, I didn't collect them at the same time. I do know that. And one of the things that's fascinating about these cards is we think of the cards with our own references to photography. And of course, we're thinking about photography in the, you know, second heading into the third decade of the 21st century. We all have cameras on our phones. We're not even carrying cameras anymore. But these, the first card was actually um, mailed in 1904. And back then photography was a very different prospect. It was not as, as fluid as we make it today. So many of the cards that we see were in fact posed. They were not sort of snapped shots that were taken as people were in movement or walking around. They were posed in some kinds of ways. And this is showing us that this is a card that was posed in two different ways. In uh, the card on the right of your screen as you, or the left of your screen as you're watching is the older of the two cards. It was actually mailed in 1904 and it shows a smaller group of people uh, they both have the same title, more or less. And then the right card, we've added an additional person. The hat has moved from the right side to the left side. Uh, the men are facing us in a slightly different way. So we've got a different composition altogether. But basically, 
they were probably, the images were probably taken, not probably, more than likely taken on the same day with the same people. So it's it's also telling us something about the way that the cards were were taken, were documented, the way that the photographs were taken. And so I found that fascinating as well. Thank you. This next card is from Martinique. And this card reminds me of a good friend of mine, all that hair, this, this beautiful woman from Martinique. It's rare to see depictions of black women of that era with uh, such a, a comfortability with their, their natural selves. Talk to me about this card and why you collected it. Well, I have a whole category of cards. Um, I have a whole category of cards that I simply call beautiful women. Mm -hmm. And she certainly fits into that. I've got a, a range of beautiful women. Unfortunately, we don't have the time today to see all of them, but some of them are in traditional dress. Some of them are kind of relaxed and more comfortable as this one. They are from all, well, I think most of the, uh, the regions that I collect from, and I collect cards from, from the African continent, from the Caribbean, and to the degree that I can find them from the United States. But when we get into the United States, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But I think the other thing is the interesting way that her hair is just flowing free and that yes. she is herself in the image. I think that that's important. And those of us, particularly nowadays, who have been, you know, sort of sequestered for three or four months or a year and who have had to um, come to our own relationships and to deepen perhaps our relationships with our hair. Yes. I, I, I love this card because it's like, okay, be yourself. It's love yourself, be as comfortable with you and your hair as she is with hers. It's like, this is me. It seems ahead of its time, <laughs> yes. Literally, literally ahead of its time. She is just so comfortable, I love her. She is obviously, in a relaxed state, uh, it's posed. It's it's a studio pose. You can see from the backdrop, but she is comfortable in her skin, and I think that's what we're all aiming to be. Yes. This next card was mailed in 1901. The Coal Lady. Oh, chapeau. You say whatever I want, so I pick. Yeah? Bonjour, mademoiselle. Fine hat, lady. I take it. You make photograph? No, I take beau chapeau, yes? C'est pour moi. Give it to me, I will wear it. Yes, with this dress. It's just some working clothes, I know. That's why I need Le Chapeau. I can try your things. It's what you said. I want this one. Secre joli. This one is better for me. Come on, monsieur. I have to go back to work. I wear this hat, you take photograph, then I go back to the ship. How must I stand? I like this one, I say to you. Je conquis le chabon. I am the coal conqueror. General Transatlantic thinks the coal belongs to them, but no, it is mine. It is in me, I am in it. I am traveling the world, fueling the ships. I'm taking these people from here to there across the waters, parting the waves of the sea. The ships? What do you want to know? They are big. I feed it with my coals. <laughs> Mama sends me to do this work. What else is there for strong girls? This work, not for a lady. But a lady does wear this hat. I work and wear these clothes, but I am a lady on the inside. I carry these coals from the mines to the ship. One day, I will go with it. Protestant, protestant, beau chapeau. 
We have another amazing film interpretation of one of the postcards. This card, I have a nickname for the, the it's cool lady in the book. And when I see it, I think cool lady. But of course, the work <laughs> she was, I mean, she looks cool. But of course, the work she's doing was not cool at all. Hard you, manual labor. Oof, the work she was doing was incredible. The card actually has written on it, the women do the hard work in Martinique, each full basket each full basket weighs 46 kilos. A uh, kilo is 2.2 pounds, so that's like 95 pounds more or less, probably just under 100 pounds. And they get one sou, which is not a lot of money, per two baskets. They carry on average 200 a day, which makes about 10,000 kilos carried on their heads. And the coal, that's that's just extraordinary and, and horrifying and awful in its own way. I love her. I really do love her because if you look in her face, she's got a style and a sass and a, again, a sense of self. Yes. She is very much that person that, that Gabrielle picked up on in the sense of, I am me. I, uh, you know, this is what I do, but I am me. You know, be very clear that I am me and I will have, you know, my, my way with things. Um, for costume historians, I love this card because it shows that proverbial double hitch. Um, women in the African diaspora, when they worked, would tie their long skirts up in that double hitch the skirts were longer. They weren't that mid, um, mid, you know, just below the knee length. So her skirt is tied up with another piece of cloth so that she can work and so she can carry that. Why was she carrying coal may be a question. Yes. And the whole thing is that coal was what was used to fuel the ships. Uh, the Compagnie Transatlantique, uh, Compagnie Générale Transatlantique, which was the big uh, transatlantic transport vessel that took all of the goods back and forth from France to the Caribbean and vice versa, um, was powered by coal. And so there's another postcard from the book that's actually used in the, um, in the, the film. It shows all of those people going up on deck, you know, lined up. Again, another one of those line postcards like the women with the water, um, yes. where they're doing work in France, it's called French, it's called a corvée. So this corvée is taking the coal up on to provision the ship's engines. And so they just did this steadily until the ship had enough coal to keep its engines running across the Atlantic and back. She's so barefoot it's, as well. I see she's not wearing absolutely, shoes. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. she's, and this is her work clothes. We don't know how she looks when she gets dressed up to go to mass on Sunday. I imagine she's glorious on Sunday. She must be incredible yeah. on Sunday. But this is another one of those things. A lot of people were taken in these cards in their work outfits not necessarily as they might have wanted to present themselves. This is a question that still comes into 20th century and even to some degree 21st century photography when people are taking pictures of large quotation marks around it, others, yes. you know, oh, isn't that picturesque? Right. But this may not be how I want to present myself. This may Wonder. be- but she yeah. has obviously made some kind of a bargain, as Gabrielle alludes to in the, uh, in the video. Um, she's posed. This is a posed picture in a studio. So she's like, mm -hmm. I'm still in control. So and she was hopefully that. paid for this photo. I would oh, imagine. I'm sure she got something. Maybe it was the hat. And speaking of hats, <laughs> that's a perfect segue into this next postcard. 
of the female vegetable vendors. So this is a magnificent card. I, I see this card and they're carrying vegetables, but the, the vegetables look like glorious fashion hats. They look like they're walking <laughs> down a runway on the streets of Charleston there. Exactly. Well, this is Charleston, South Carolina. And these are the vegetable vendors, which were sometimes called the Mamas, the M-A-U-M-A-S. And they are, again, these are women with a sense of self. If you look, this lady's got her hands on her hips. She is sassy in, in a very real way. It's probably a bit of a later card because I'm seeing that it's probably was taken in the street. If you look, we actually see shadows and unless the shadows are on some kind of backdrop, this may have been taken in situ. But the whole idea of Charleston and vegetable vendors, there is a companion card to this, which is a male vegetable vendor with a tray on his head. And I have them both and I am delighted to own them both. But this whole notion of street vendors, and a lot of the cards are of street vendors, that whole street cry thing, Charleston, certainly back at the turn of the 20th century, uh, probably until the mid 20th century, used to ring with the varying street cries of vendors selling their goods. Anybody who's familiar with Porgy and Bess knows that whole round that begins, I'm not sure if it's act one or act, I think it's act one, but it's there early on when, you know, you've got the strawberry woman and you've got the the crab man, and you've got, you know, all of these vendors that come out on Catfish Row at the beginning. But that was, that was the oral backdrop for most of the cities in the United States. Yes. It was thus in New Orleans. It was thus in New York. New York had hot corn vendors who sold roasted corn on the street. They had oyster salesmen. In Charleston, they had the vegetable vendors. And it was just, this was how people got their groceries. They went to the market, but then sometimes the groceries, the vegetables would come to them. So they've got all of that as well. So I love this card for just that reason. And the fact that her hands are on her hips and she's like daring him to take her picture in another way. They still have them in Baltimore, the, the vendors, and they call them A-Rabbers, and they also yeah. do the calls. Yeah, yes. I actually have a card of Baltimore A-Rabbers, too, because mm -hmm. the street vendors are, are people who just absolutely fascinate me. Yes, I can imagine. So now let's move on to this next one. And we have a set of two this time. And these cards have two different labels. The first one is Old Time Kitchen and Darkie. And the second one is Old Southern Kitchen and Negro Mammy. And that Mrs. brings us. Yes. Go that on. brings us to the United States. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the cards in the United States are in many ways different. And I say that in, you know, in large quotation marks. We've seen in the Caribbean the coal carrier and we've seen the uh, the woman with the hair. Um, in the United States, we are, or the cards are in general compass, and I haven't seen every postcard published in the United States, don't know, so I'm making a gross generality, but the generality would suggest that the American view of African Americans printed on cards is different. Um, the vegetable ladies break that model. I have one or two other cards that break that model and that present African Americans in a, not necessarily positive light, but in a neutral light of some sort. Um, but generally speaking, the cards are more like this. And there's a whole category of cards that I refuse to even collect. I mean, there are cards that are that are, are loathsome for want of a better term in terms of how African Americans are portrayed and, um, and the kinds of commentaries that are made. Um, in this case, it was sort of not completely benign. Obviously, it's the same photograph. 
Yeah. It's the same photograph. They've been colorized slightly differently. I suspect that the one on the left of your screen, the darky one, is the older of the two. Actually, it was um, mailed, and I have both of those cards have been mailed. So the one on the left of the screen was mailed in 1907. Mm. Now, what happened also with postcards is images were often reused. And so because they were reused, you could get the same postcard, the same image, perhaps colorized slightly differently as is the case here and republished um, years later. So it's very difficult in some ways to date postcards. You can date them uh, some ways through postal regulations. Earlier postcards have what is called an undivided back the address goes all the way across the back and you had to write anything if you were going to write anything on the front of the card. Mm. Later cards, you have a divided back, which is the postcard that we're more familiar with now, where you can write on one side and the address goes on the other side and the front is just the image. So that when you know those differences, you can begin to date cards, but it is very difficult, certainly for me to do. And um, while I may be a Deltiologist, I am not necessarily an expert by any stretch of the imagination. I am a, an amateur who loves them. But so in this case, we've got a, a time frame of only really five years. Yes. 1907 to 1912. But the language has changed. It's not necessarily inoffensive but it is marginally better. She is no longer a darkie. She is a Negro mammy. Negro mammy. You know. Yes. Uh, these images actually remind me of oral histories about my great-great-grandmother's kitchen. So the image itself has a familiar feel to me, but of course the language is, is problematic. Right. But I mean, if you look at it, that's another reason probably that I collected the initial one, and I'm not sure which card I purchased first. But if you look at them, you can certainly see the whole, um, the kitchen supplies. You've got the ovens, you've got mortars and pestles, you've got, uh, the kitchen is set up. This is probably not the kitchen in her, her living quarters. This is the kitchen where she works, where she is in some kind of uh, domestic work. Um, and so she's got sort of the tools of her trade arranged by her. I think this card in its own way really sort of celebrates the, um, just the ingenuity of the African-American chef, the African-American cook, uh, who was in charge of all of, well, many, I'll be, I'll be generous, so many of the kitchens in so many houses, not just in the American South, but throughout the country. And so I, I like to think of this card as sort of a hom homage to that as well. A heart, yes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> this next one, I'm going to read the caption, <laughs> the old slave block. The old slave block in the old St. Louis Hotel, New Orleans, Louisiana. The colored woman standing on the block was sold for $1,500 on this same block when a little girl. Rise are gone. Was there, right there. Just a stair step block of wood. Little legs had a hard time getting up on it. I was just a girl child. They pushed me up on it though, skinned my knee. There I was propped up on it. That me, she gone like that riser. I'm about worn as them there planks now. Nah. Then, oh, back then I was myself, still myself then. Afraid though, didn't know what was in store, couldn't know. 
Afraid of the things that ain't nobody ever should know. Right to be afraid, show sure enough, because that's where I died. Right there. I wasn't one they told me away from my mom's skirts. Our eyes wet with tears. Her saying to me, be a good girl. I don't know what good it do to be good when I wasn't seen as human. And that me, she still could see good. See the good. Think on good things. <laughs> that me, she like humming things. Bees, mosquitoes. <laughs> Never mind the itching. Everywhere they go, they got a tool. Humming things. Amuse their own self. And that me, she like that. She liked a lot of fires too, watching it burn. Turn wood to dust. Still up there. Right there, I went from somebody and something to, to nothing, like that wood. Dead. Gone from me. They ain't sell me here. They killed me dead. Spirit disappeared. Mind flew away. Only a caucus left for them to do whatever they would with it. Well, they ate off it good. So good, Master Mason and his sons to war to keep eating off me, to keep me that nothing. Lost, though. <laughs> and that's when I went looking for that old me, my ma and relations. Been years of searching. Trail run dry. I only come back for one thing. <clears throat> Even my spit be seed. I'm my own Lazarus. I raised myself. I pushed them stones away and I don't come out. This new me, hmm, she a humming thing. She go on her way with a tune in the air. Mm -hmm. That was quite moving. You know, we have an auction block here at the museum um, that we collected in Hagerstown, Maryland, and it was actually sitting there until we collected it. So I imagine that there are other auction blocks out there yeah. um, just and sitting. Yeah. The fascinating thing about the auction block at the museum, if I'm not mistaken, is it had been preserved not because it was an auction block, but because it was the site of some kind of because Andrew Jackson stood there. Well, there you go. I mean, you know, yes, some kind yes. of strange, innocuous, not really massively right. important. I mean, Andrew Jackson, you know, woo -woo. Uh, but it wasn't one of his major speeches. It was just he had, you know, Washington slept here kind of thing. Exactly. So that the auction blocks are extraordinary. This is the last card of this set of cards, the most recent purchase. I was going to say last, but I know me, and it probably isn't the last. I found it online, and I was astounded. I knew it existed. I never thought I would own it. Because this card is just such a harrowing summation of our history. Um, you know, and to try to imagine what someone would feel to return to that place in that way yes. after that time. And then in my discussions with Gabrielle, it was very interesting because 
I gave her a little bit of my own family history that she incorporated into it, which I thought was, first of all, astounding and amazing and for which I am grateful. I have a letter from my grandmother about my family history and my grandmother, Bertha Philpot Jones, was the descendant of an enslaved man named Samuel Philpot. And I have a handwritten note, it's in pencil, so you can barely read it in my grandmother's handwriting. And she talks about the family history on my maternal side of the family. And in that note, she recounts that her, her father's mother, so it would have been my great, great grandmother, was sold south. The family was from Virginia. And at some point, Samuel Philpott's mother, I don't know her name, was sold south. But the part that Gabrielle incorporated and the part that is so moving to me is, as my great grandfather recalled it, her last words to him were, and he was two years old at the time, be a good boy, Sammy. And that was his last memory of his mother. And it's a memory that he retained, well, he actually lived to be 100, I think 101 or 102. And that was a memory that he had retained so that this whole notion of separated families, of parents and children separated on these auction blocks is an immensely personal notion to me. Yes. And so that's why this card means so much. And that's why this card is all about the dialogues. The other thing about the card is we, in all of the other cards, have to think about what we think they mean. If we had this card without the caption, we might know that it was a woman on the slave block, but we wouldn't know the backstory. This is the only card where we actually know what's going on. What do and we think, know about the creator of this card? I know nothing. I know absolutely nothing. I'm sure that there is information to know. You can look up M. Barnett. M. Barnett was a trader of many things, including enslaved humans mm -hmm. um, in New Orleans. But beyond that, I really haven't done any deep research. It's certainly there to do. And maybe somebody will let us know. It's a powerful card and a, and a powerful film to go along with that. Um, our last card is the Amazon Women. And these are this is one of the last cards of the, the fond warriors of Dahomey. Talk to us about this card. Is this from the famous French photographer, Fortier? I believe that this is part of the Fortier collection. Fortier was a French um, ethnographer, for want of a better term. He was a photographer. He was a French photographer who went out to West Africa in the latter part of the 19th century. He set up a photographic studio and he traveled around West Africa and there he found, well, he took pictures everywhere he went. So the Fortier, F-O-R-T-I-E-R, -E for those of you who are curious, um, the Fortier archives are amazing compendiums of, of shots of real people, um, usually in situ throughout West Africa. He went as far south, I believe, as Benin. It was French West Africa, so it was the old AOF, Afrique Occidentale Française. He didn't go below into, uh, you know, sort of more uh, Congolese 
Bantu areas. But what he went to was there. He also went nor north and toward the east. So he did several different trips. These are Beyonce's Amazons. The Amazons, and we, we hear of the term Amazon used a lot. She's a real Amazon. But uh, it goes back to Greek mythology. These were the women warriors. Uh, these were the women warriors of the court of King Beonzin. Beonzin was the last king, the last traditional king of Dahomey. And here's an interesting point of connection. I spoke a little earlier about the monk who had written the Kora music and performed it. He is a direct descendant of Beyonce. Mm. So we have uh, circles within yeah. circles and, and you know. Gives me chills to think about that. Yeah. Um, so, um, so he would be thrilled to, to see this, but these are the women warriors. They are, they were ferocious. And in fact, they fought the French. They fought the French, they fought against the French and the French soldiers were astounded because after they had been vanquished, the soldiers went to take trophies and what they would take trophies as would be the genitals of the men that they had killed. And they went to take trophies and it was like, oh my God, they're women. <laughs> so they were so ferocious. They were so indomitable. They were so extraordinary that they were not even recognized in their gender until later. Yeah. So this was just an incredible, and I love, I love the faces on these women. Yeah, they're still defiant, yes. They are, we've talked about women who are themselves in this. These women are so completely and totally and absolutely, yes, in defeat, but themselves. There's one who's turning and looking at the camera. They are amazing. I also like the jewelry. They got, they got good stuff that they are wearing. They are, they are my heroines. And I keep a copy of this card on my desk where I write, because I like to hope that the spirit of these women follows me and hopefully, and this is our last postcard, yes. hopefully they will follow us. So I didn't want to leave us on the auction block, although there is triumph at the end of that. Yes. And I don't want us to look at this card and think of defeat. I want us to think of defiance. I want to think us to think of strength. I want us to think of that power that has kept us moving forward and going and fighting against odds and being absolutely ourselves in those struggles. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Harrison. And thank you for leaving us with this spirit. We, we certainly could use this image on all of our desks. I wanna wrap up now so that we can um, have a discussion with our audience. But first I'd like to introduce the filmmaker, Gabriel Fulton Ponder. Uh, Gabriel Fulton Ponder is a playwright, indie filmmaker and television writer. She has written for the Will Packer produced Oprah Winfrey Network series, Ambitions and the upcoming BET series, Sacrifice. Gabrielle wrote, produced, and directed Irreconciliable, an award-winning short film starring Jasmine Guy and Dick Gregory, which aired on HBO and was a finalist honored at the American Black Film Festival. For more than 15 years, her works for the stage have been produced, developed, or workshopped at the Tony Award-winning Alliance Theater and many other theaters around the country. She is assistant professor of screenwriting at Kennesaw State University, Georgia born and raised, Gabrielle earned her BA in history sociology at Columbia University and her MFA in writing for the screen and stage at Northwestern University. So thank you for joining us, Gabrielle. Thank you, Kelly. That was a really nice introduction. I appreciate that. And before I, I take questions from the audience, let me just ask you to tell us a little bit about the process of creating films from those postcards. 
Well, um, okay, so first I have to thank Jessica, right? I wanna honor her because, you know, just for having the curiosity and foresight to be about the business of collection, right? I've traveled to many places on the continent and in the diaspora and never thought to do like such a wonderful, um, a wonderful thing. Uh, these postcards present images that I couldn't have imagined while growing up in the American South. And they really inspire a new sense of self, connection, history, and belonging. Um, so with these postcards, my goal was to give our ancestors a voice, right? To expand the dialogue of what we imagine when we you know, see and when we're looking at people of African descent in photographs and whatnot. Um, but I've been writing monologues <laughs> based on photographs since high school. Uh, thank God for English and drama teachers, right? Um, they had us doing these sorts of exercises back then. I had amazing ones. But photographs and images have given me the opportunity to step outside myself and not just imagine what someone else's life is like, but to try to empathize with their experience. Um, this is the gift, the great gift of drama found within the monologues. And it's this cultivation of empathy. Um, so my process, like Jessica said, she and I had several conversations about the chosen postcards. And you know there was a great deal of inspection uh, exploration of them. And then I, you know, just would look at them and, and listen, you know, try to hear uh, what they might have to say to me uh, and imagine. Then I moved on to research and researching the locations in which they're set. Uh, then listen some more. <laughs> and then craft comes in a lot later. Um, for the Brio, I wanted to um, get to the essence of what a griot does, which is, you know, like Jessica mentioned earlier, they pour into a community by telling stories of the history of a people. Uh, a model uh, for me with this particular one was, um, it's the Epic of Sunjata, right? Which you can find depictions of online. It's amazing, uh, but it's, it's long and we didn't have time for a full storytelling experience. so. I wanted to recreate a feeling of what griots do and have him speak to the Africans in America, African Americans, Caribbeans, and so forth. Um, so while the griot is an invocation of sorts, uh, with the coat carrier, I focused on uh, going through. That was, you know, those were the words, uh, you know, in my mind. She's in the photographer studio. Um, who would most likely, you know, have been a, a, a Richman, <laughs> um, as she's in Martinique. But this being in process and going through an experience was top of mind during the writing process. Uh, so her back and forth with the photographer, um, a, a colonizer, you know, um, was important to me. And so then with Auction Block, there's a recalling. Um, her experience at this place, this auction block, it's being remembered. And I was compelled to express a transcendence of sorts, you know, this, her transcending uh, this incredibly inhumane thing that happened to her at the auction block, while at the same time highlighting her, her humanity. Yes. Um, so as artists, you know, our job is to make the invisible visible and that was my goal with these pieces. Thank you, thank you, Gabrielle. Now let's pull some questions from the audience. I have one here. Uh, Dr. Harris, can you discuss why you collected postcards depicting beautiful black women doing work? Did you collect any cards of people leisure at leisure, studying, praying, or playing? <laughs> well, that's a good that's a good question. The title of the book is Vintage Postcards from the African World in the dignity of their work and the joy of their play. So in the book, there are pictures of people praying. There are, there is a, uh, I think there's an early card called La Prière, which is the, uh, the Muslim call to prayer. Um, and it's people kneeling toward Mecca. There is a, a procession, a religious, Catholic religion procession, religious procession 
there is a there are a couple of cards of tam tam the tam tam being uh you know the french take or the french word that was used to describe um to describe probably traditional ceremony of some sort there are um afro you know um there are um, some ceremony. I have a set of four cards that are believe are by Fortier, but that are all of ceremony in uh, in what was then Dahomey, which is now Benin, of religious ceremony of, of Vaudin, the Vaudinci dancing in various ways. Um, and uh, a particular favorite is. I, I, I believe it's a South African card, uh, and it is two women playing ping pong. It's a card that was mailed in 1903. So yes, it is not just um, it's not just the um, not just the work. And I wanted those two words in the dignity of their work. I wanted dignity to be expressed because I think we don't always think of how dignified people were in their work. Think of all of the people who went to work in a suit and then at work changed into overalls, but there was dignity and that dignity is important. And then, and the joy of their play, because I think joy is a word we hear a little too little of. And, and I wanted both of those words, dignity and joy, to be very much a part of what I was trying to show in these cards. You certainly accomplished that. Um, here's another question. Uh, what, and either of you could answer this one. Um, what do these postcards from the continent reveal about contemporary African-American life? Um, I think, well, all of the cards are not from the continent. The, con the, the cards are from the diaspora and I think I think what they reveal in many ways is um, the past is prologue. Um, Gabrielle said something very important when she said, um, and I think you may have echoed it or you said it and Gabrielle echoed it, but these are the faces of the ancestors. These are the people without whom we would not be here. And so in their work, in their joy, we find that on which we build. And so that's, again, a part of who they are to me. And by extension, in a way, who they are to us all. Yes, I think we have time for one more question um, before we wrap it up here. And let's see, here's one. What narratives would more recent images tell? If, we, if you found um, contemporary postcards, and of course we do have contemporary postcards, but it, are you drawn to any contemporary postcards? Let me rephrase it that way. And what are the stories that those cards tell? Well, actually, because I live in the contemporary world, I'm not really drawn to contemporary cards. I stop collecting cards that stop around the 1940s, which would be, God help us all, uh, the decade in which I was born. But I think that recently, well, first of all, I think postcards have changed. I think because we have so many other ways of accessing imagery, of talking to each other, of, of looking at things, um, we don't use cards the same way at all. Uh, with contemporary cards, um, I recently did a show that may still be online for the Martha's Vineyard Museum of Cards of Martha's Vineyard. And I know that at NAMAC, at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, there is a section called uh, Pride of Place, if I'm not mistaken. And there is a section on Martha's Vineyard. There's a section on Oak Bluffs. Well, the Martha's Vineyard Museum has an extensive collection of postcards of the island. And I also collect cards of Martha's Vineyard but I was, as the British would say, gobsmacked to realize that there are no cards of African Americans on the vineyard. Not even contemporary ones. That's fascinating. Hmm. So that 
um, so that it becomes, you know, it becomes interesting. And as I said earlier, as I began to talk about cards earlier, African American in the United Statesian sense, cards of African Americans are in many, many, many ways more problematic. So that uh, it's not to say that the others are not problematic in their own ways, but that that the fact that, Af you know, Oak Bluffs has been a living, breathing heart and soul of parts of the African-American world for almost a century, probably a little bit more, and that there are no cards. What does that mean? Or what does that tell us? And then, you know, then we can go on from there. But I don't really collect contemporary cards because I am just personally more interested in what the older cards have to say as a story. I feel like I could talk to you all afternoon about this, <laughs> these cards and about this topic of representation. But we do have to wrap up now. And I would like to thank both of you. Thank Dr. Jessica B. Harris. Thank Gabrielle Ponder. Um, for your work and for being here today to answer these questions. I would like to thank our staff and the audience for joining us today and also the William R. Keenan Charitable Trust for supporting us um, in this effort, in this, in this particular program. And it's just, it's just been a, a wonderful time here with you. So thank you very much. Well, I like to have the last word. So I want to thank all <laughs> of you. And I want to yes. thank those of you out there in cyberspace. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Gabrielle, and thank you, everybody at NAMAC.